Hi, and this is theCUBE on Cloud. I'm Stu Miniman, and really excited to welcome to a special fireside chat. Uh, CUBE alumni has been on the program uh, so many times. We always love talking to founders. We like talking to deep thinkers, and, that, and that's why uh, he, he was one of the early ones that I reached out to uh, when we were on uh, this event. Uh, when we first started conversations, we were looking at how hyperscalers uh, really were taking adoption of the brand new technologies, things like flash, things like software defined networking, and how that would invade uh, the enterprise. That of course uh, has had a huge impact, uh, helped create a category called hyperconverged infrastructure. And I'm talking about Dheeraj Pandey. He is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Nutanix taking HCI from hyperconverged infrastructure to hybrid cloud infrastructure. So Dheeraj, welcome to the Fireside Chat. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Stu, and uh, thank you for the last 10 years. You know, we've grown together, uh, both the Cube and Nutanix, and myself as a leader in the last 10 years. So uh, bringing HCI from hyperconverged to hybrid cloud is, uh, you know, just reminds me of how the more things change, the more they remain the same. So looking forward to a great discussion here. So we talk about that, that early discussion, you know, what the hyperscalers were doing, you know, how can the enterprise take advantage of that? Uh, over time, enterprises matured and looked a little bit more like the hyperscalers. Hybrid cloud, of course, is on everyone's lip, as well as we've seen the hyperscalers themselves look more and more like the enterprise. So hybrid and multi-cloud is where we are today. We think it'll be in the future, but give us a little bit as to how you've seen that progression today and you know where 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 are we going uh, you know down the road here mm -hmm. yeah i think uh, you know i talked about this uh, during my dot next uh, uh, keynote and the whole idea of uh, you know we uh, in every recession we make things smaller you know in 91 we said we're going to go away from mainframes into unix servers uh, and we made the unit of compute smaller then in the year 2000, when there was the next bubble burst and the recession afterwards, we moved from Unix servers to Wintel, you know, Windows and Intel, x86, and eventually Linux as well. Again, we made things smaller, going from million dollar servers to $5,000 servers, uh, shorter lived servers. And um, that's what we did in 2008, 2009. I said, look, we don't even need to buy servers. We can do things with virtual machines, which are, uh, servers that are an incarnation in the digital world. There's nothing in the physical world that actually even lives. But we made it even smaller. And now, with cloud in the last three, four years, and what will happen in this coming decade, we're going to make it even smaller, not just in space, which is size, you know, with functions and containers and, uh, and virtual machines, but also in time, you know. So space and time, you know, we're talking about uh, hourly billing and monthly billing and uh, one-year terms as opposed to really going and committing to five or seven years of hardware and capex. So I think as we make things smaller, I mean, and this is true for our, as as consumers, you know, we have shorter attention spans. You know, things are moving fast. The cycle of creative destruction uh, of virtual machines is shrinking as well. So uh, I think in many uh, cases, we, you know, we've gone and created this autonomy, massive sprawl, like we created a massive sprawl of Intel servers back between 95 and 2005. Then we had to use virtualization to go and consolidate all of it, you know, created beautiful data centers of Intel servers with uh, VMware software. And then, uh, you know, we created a massive sprawl of uh, data centers and we consolidated data centers with one-click private cloud in the last five years. And, hopefully in the next five too. But I think we're also now creating a proliferation of clouds. There's a sprawl, massive sprawl of cost centers and such. So we need yet another layer of software to, for governance to rein in on that chaos. Hence the need for uh, a new HCI hybrid cloud infrastructure. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's fascinating to kind of watch that progression uh, and over time, there was, a, there was a phenomenal Atlantic article, I, I think it was from like the 1940s or 1950s, where somebody it, it took what was happening post-World War II um, and projected things out. And you know, we're talking really pre the internet, but just the miniaturization and the acceleration, you know, kind of the Moore's Law discussion, if you, if you take things out, where it would go. Uh, when, when I talked to Amazon, uh, they, they said, you know, the one thing that we know for sure, we I'm talking amazon.com, is that people will want it faster and cheaper in the future. 
I don't know mm -hmm. which robot or drone or things that they have, but absolutely there are those certain characteristics. So um, from a leadership standpoint, Deeraj, you talk about these changes. You know, we had the wave of virtualization, the wave of containerization. You talked about functions and serverless. Th those are tools, but at the end of the day, it's, it's about the outcomes and you know, how do we take advantage of things. So how is a leader, do you make sure that you, you know, know where to take the company as these you know, technology waves and changes you know, impact what you're doing? Yeah, so it's a great point. I mean, you know, we celebrate things in IT a lot, uh, but we don't talk about, you know, what does it take? What's the underlying fabric to really use these things successfully and better than others and not just use buzzwords? Uh, because new buzzwords will come in the next three years. You know, uh, you know for example, AI and ML has been a great buzzword for the last three, four years. But there's very few companies, probably less than even half a percent, who know how to leverage uh, machine learning, even understand the difference between machine learning and AI. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to a few principles. You know, there are some culture principles, uh, not the least of which is how you celebrate failure. Because now you're doing shorter, smaller things, you've got to be more agile, you'll have more velocity. Gone are the days of waterfall where you're doing yearly planning and three-year releases and such. So as we get into this new world, not everything will be perfect. And you've got to really learn to pick yourself up and recover quickly, you know, heal quickly and such. So that is the fundamental tenet of, tenet of uh, Silicon Valley. And we've got to really go and use this more outside the valley as well uh, in every company out there, you know, whether it's East Coast companies or Midwest companies or outside the U.S., I think this idea that uh, you will be vulnerable, more vulnerable, as you go and uh, learn to do things faster and shorter. Uh, I think product management is a term that uh, we don't fully understand. You know, and this is about the why before the how and the what. We quickly jump to the what. You know, containers and functions and you know databases as a service and AI and ML. They're the what. But how do you really start with the why? You know, you know my fascination for one of my distant mentors in you know, Simon Sinek and how he thinks about uh, most companies just focus on the what, while very few actually start with why, then the how, then the what itself. And product management has to play a key role in this, uh, which also subsumes design. You know, thinking about simplification and elegance and reducing friction. Um, I think, again, very few companies, probably no more than 1% of the companies, really understand what it means to start with design and APIs, you know, user experience, um, APIs for developers before you even get to writing any single line of code. So I think to me, that's leadership, you know, when you can, uh, you know, stay away from instant gratification of the end result, but start with the why, then the how, then the what. Yeah, as we know in the technology space, oftentimes the technology is the easy part. It's you know helping to drive that change. You know, I think back to the early days uh, when we were talking. Uh, it was you know hyperconverged. It was a threat to storage. We're going to put you out of a job, and we'd always go and say, "Look, no, 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 we're not putting you out of a job. We're going to free you up to do the things that you want to do." You know, that security mm -hmm. project that's been sitting on the shelf for six months. You can go do that. Helping you know build new parts of the business. There, there's things that you can do. It's, it's that shifting a mindset can be so difficult. Um, and dear, dear, I mean, you look at 2020, you know, everyone has had to shift uh, their mindset for everything. Uh, you know, I, I was spending half my time on the road. Uh, I don't miss the hotels. I do miss seeing lots of, lots of people in, in person. So, you know, what's your, what's your advice for people as they, how they can stay, you know, malleable, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, open to uh, s some change. Uh, you know, what are you seeing out there? What, what advice do you give there? Um, yeah, I think, you know, as, as you said, you know, inertia is uh, at the core of most things uh, in our lives, uh, including what we saw in healthcare for the last 20, 30 years. I mean, uh, there was so much regulation, you know, the, doctor com the doctor's community had to move forward, nurses had to move forward. I mean, not just providers, but insurance companies. And finally, all of a sudden, we are talking about telehealth, you know, because of the pandemic. Uh, we are talking about online learning. I mean, the things that higher ed refused to do 
I mean, if you think about the last 20 years of what has happened with the cost of higher ed, I mean, it's 200% growth in when the cost of television has gone down by probably 100, 200% with more features, uh, you know, healthcare, higher ed, uh, education in general, all of a sudden has come in for this deep shock uh, because of the pandemic. And I think it's these kind of black swan moments that really change the world. And, and uh, I know it's a cliche to say this, but I feel like we are going to be in a new normal, uh, you know, and we have been forced to this new change of digital. And you and I are sitting and talking uh, over the internet. It's a little awkward right now because there's a little bit of a delay in which the way I'm looking at things, but I know it's going to directionally be right. I mean, we will go... Uh, in, in in a way where this becomes seamless over time, so change is the only constant, and and I, I believe that uh, I think what we've seen in the pandemic is just the beginning of what digital will mean going forward. Um, and, and I think the more people embrace it, the faster we do it. The uh, speed is going to be the name of the game when it comes to survival and thriving in this new age. Dear, it, it, it's interesting. We, we do hope, you know, I, I'm a technologist. I know you're an optimist when it, when it comes to things. So we always look at those silver linings. Like I, I hope healthcare and education will be able to move forward fast. Uh, you know, higher education costs, you know, inequity out there to, for access to medicine. Uh, it would be wonderful if we could help solve some of that uh, despite this gl global pandemic. Uh, one of the other results, uh, dear, is we talked about some very, you know, shifts in the marketplace the large tech players really have emerged in winners so far in 2020. I, I can't help but watch the stock market. And, you know, Apple is, is bigger than ever. Amazon, you know, Google all ended up in front of Congress to talk about how the, if they've gotten too big. Um, you've, you've partnered with, uh, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Uh, they are, you know, potentially a threat, but also a partner. You know, from your standpoint, have they gotten too much power? Do we have an inequity in the tech world that they are, you know, creating the universes that they will just kind of block off and, and limit innovation? What, what, what's your take on big tech? Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, there's always been big something. I mean, if you go back to the 90s, you know, Amazon, uh, not Amazon, IBM was big uh, and Microsoft was big and AT&T was big. I mean, there's always been big companies, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the consumer effect that they've uh, had as well. I mean, and uh, uh, I think what we're seeing right now is no different. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the good thing about the great thing about this country is that there's always disruption happening. Uh, and uh, Sometimes small is way better and way more competitive than big. Now, at the same time, I do look up to the way some of them have organized themselves. Like the way Amazon has organized itself is, is uh, really unique and creative with general managers and very independent, highly autonomous groups. So some of these organizations will definitely survive and thrive in scale. And yet for others, I think decision-making and uh, staying competitive and staying scrappy will come a lot harder. So to me, uh, when I look at uh, these big names and what Congress is talking about and such, I feel like this is no different than 20, 30, 40 years ago. You know, we have always talk. I mean, we talked about Rockefeller and, uh, you know, the oil giants back from 100 years ago. And uh, so in many ways, I think the more things change, the more they remain the same. All we have to do is we have to walk over to where the customer is. And that's what we've done with our partnerships, like in Amazon and Azure. We are saying, look, uh, we can even use your commits and credits. I mean, that is a, a very elegant way to go to where the customer is rather than force them to where we are. And the public cloud is facing this too. We, they've come to realize in the last two years that they cannot force all of enterprise computing to come to hyperscale as data centers. They'll have to take in these bite-sized, smaller clouds to where the customer is, where the customer's machines are, where the customer's people are, where the customer's data is. That's where we also take to disperse the cloud itself. So I think there's going to be a yin-yang where you know, we'll try to walk with the customer to where we want them to be, whether it's a hyperscale data center or the notion of hybrid cloud infrastructure. But many a time we've got to walk over to where they are. I mean, and outside the U.S., I mean, the 
the cloud is such a nuanced word. I mean, uh, we're talking about sovereignty, we're talking about data gravity, we're talking about economics of owning versus renting. This trifecta, the laws of the land, uh, the laws of physics, and the laws of economics will dictate many of these things as well. So I think the, the big uh, folks are also humble and vulnerable to realize that, the, that there's nothing more powerful than market forces. And uh, I think the rest will take care of itself. Yeah, you know, my, my, my quick commentary on that, uh, Deeridge, you know, I think most of us look back at AT&T and felt that government got it wrong. The way they broke it up, it ended up consolidating back together. It didn't necessarily help consumers. Uh, Microsoft, on the other hand, uh, might have had a little bit too much power and was leveraging that uh, against competition and, and really squashing uh, innovation. So uh, in, in general, uh, it, it's good to see that uh, the uh, politics are looking at tech and it sure felt the last time I watched things, they were a little bit more educated than some previous times there where it was almost embarrassing uh, to, to watch our representatives uh, fumbling around with, with, with technology. Uh, so it, it's always good to question authority, question what they have. And one of the things you've brought up many times is you know, you're, you're open to listening and you're bringing in new ideas. Uh, I remember one conversation I had with you is, you know, there, there, there's that direction that you hold on to, but you will assess and do new data. You've made adjustments in the product portfolio and direction based on your, your customers, based on the ecosystem. Uh, and you, you, you've mentioned some of the, you know, bring, bring thoughts that you've uh, brought into the company and you share. So you, you mentioned Black Swan, uh, Nassim Taleb, uh, you brought to uh, one of the European dot next shows. It was great to be able to see that author and, and read through. Um, uh, advisors like Condoleezza Rice, who you've had uh, at, at the conferences a couple of times. Where, where are you getting some of your uh, latest inspirations from? Any you know, new authors or you know, podcasts that, that you'd be recommending to the audience? Yeah, I mean, uh, I look at adjacencies. Uh, obviously, Simon has been great. You know, he was at our dot next, talked about the infinite game, and we'll talk about the infinite game with Nutanix too, uh, with respect to also my decision. But, um, you know, uh, Brené Brown, who has been very close to Nutanix. Uh, I was just uh, looking at her latest podcast, uh, you know, and uh, uh, she was sitting with uh, the author of Stretch, uh, Scott Sonnenschein. Uh, and uh, it's a fascinating read and, and a great listen, by the way, I think for worth an hour, talking about scrappiness and... Uh, Talking about resourcefulness, you know, what does it mean to really be resourceful? And, and we need that even more so as we go through this recession, as we are sheltered in place. I think it's, uh, it's an adjacency to uh, everything that Brené does. And I was just blown away by just listening to it. So I'd uh, love for others to even, uh, you know, uh, have a listen and, and, and learn to understand what we can do within our families, with our budgets, with our companies, with our startups. I mean, with Cube, I mean, what does it mean to be scrappy and celebrate scrappiness and resourcefulness more so than, hey, I always need more. Uh, I think it's, a, I just found it uh, fascinating in the last week itself, uh, listening through it. Yeah, you know, John Furrier said, talked many times that that founder, you know, startup that, you know, being able to pull themselves up, you know, be able to drive forward, you know, overcome obstacles. So, dear, dear you did tee it up. Uh, it, it sounds like uh, it is the next step for you. Um, there's a there's a transition under discussion. Uh, you know, Bain has made an investment. Uh, there's a search for a new CEO. Uh, are, are you saying there's a book club in your future? Uh, to, to be able to get things ready. Um, what, what, why don't you explain a little bit, uh, you know, 11 years uh, took the, couple, the company public, um, you know, over 6,500 employees, you know, public uh, company. So t t tell us a little bit about the, that decision-making process and, you know, what, what, what you expect to see in the future. Yeah, it's, it's probably uh, I mean, one of the hardest things as an entrepreneur is to let go. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's, it's a creation uh, that you followed from scratch, from nothing. And uh, it was a process for me to really think about what's next for the company and then what's next for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, me and the company were so tightly coupled that uh, I was like, wow, at some point this has to be a little bit more like the way Bill Gates did it with Microsoft, uh, you know, and, and there's going to be a Marathon Zone, and you'll then start to realize that your identity is different from the company's identity. 
and maybe the company's built for bigger, better things, and maybe you built for bigger, better things. And how do you really start to first do this decoupling of the identity? And it's really hard. I mean, I'm sure that parents go through this. I mean, uh, our children are still very young. You know, our eldest is nine going on 10, um, and uh, our twin girls are six. I know at some point in the next 10 years, eight to 10 years, we'll have to figure out what it means to let go. And uh, I'm already doing this with my son. I tell him, you know, you are born free. I mean, the word born free, which, you know, drives my wife uh, crazy sometimes. I see this to them. It's about independence. And I think that the company is also born free to really think about uh, a life outside of me as well, outside of founder. And that was a, a very important process for me as I was talking to the board for the last six, seven, eight months. And uh, when the Bain uh, deal came in, I thought it was a great time. You know, we ended the fiscal really well, uh, all things considered. We had a good quarter. The transition has been a journey of a lifetime. The business model transition that I speak of, really three years. I mean, uh, I have uh, aged probably 10 years in these last three years. Uh, but I think I would not, you know, replace this for anything. Just the experience of uh, learning what it means to change as a public company when you have short-term goals and long-term goals, we need the conviction, uh, knowing what's right, because otherwise we would not have survived this cloud uh, movement at all, this idea of actually becoming a subscription company, changing the core of the business in the on-prem world itself. You know, it's, it's akin to changing the wings of a plane at 40,000 feet where None of the passengers blink. Uh, it's been phenomenal uh, right last 11 years, but it's also been nonstop, monomaniacal. I mean, I use the word marathon for this, you know, and I figured uh, it's a good time to say, figure out a way to let go of this and uh, think of what's bigger, better for Nutanix. And, you know, going from zero to a billion six in annual billings, and taking, looking at billion six to three billion to four to five, uh, I think it'd be great to look at this from afar. Uh, and at the same time, I think there's vulnerability. I mean, I've made the company vulnerable. I've made myself vulnerable. We don't know who the next leader will be. Uh, and uh, I think the next three to six months is one of the most important baton zones that I have ever experienced or been a part of. So looking forward to make sure the baton doesn't fall. We define what good to great looks like, uh, uh, both for the company and for myself. And at the same time, you know, go, go read more. I mean, I've been passionate about developers, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, 11 years. I was a developer myself. You know, this company, Nutanix, was really built by developers uh, for IT. And uh, I'm learning more about the developer as a consumer. How do you think about their experience, not just the things that we throw at them from open source point of view and from cloud and technologies and AI and ML point of view, but uh, the, really their lives, you know, having them think about revenue and, and uh, business and really blurring the lines between architects and product managers and developers. I think it's just an, uh, it's just an unfathomable problem we've created in IT that I'd love to go and read and write more about. Yeah, so, 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 so many important things you said there. I, I absolutely think uh, there, there's certain things, everybody of course will think of you for, for, for a long time uh, with Nutanix, but th there is that separation between the role in the company and, and the person itself. Um, and I and really appreciated how much you've always shared along those, uh, along, along those, uh, those lines. Uh, so last, last question I have you, and you teed it up a little bit when you talked about developers. What do you, you know, take off your Nutanix hat for a second here. You know, what do we need to do to make sure that the, the next decade is successful uh, in this space? You know, cloud as a, as, as a general guideline. Because we, we know we have skill gap. We know we need more people. We need more diversity. Um, but th there's so much that we need and there's so much opportunity. Uh, but, you know, what, what do you see in any, any advice or areas that you think are, are, are critical for success in the future? Yeah, I mean, you know, you hit upon something that I have had a passion for, uh, probably more latent as well, more so than uh, conspicuous, 
uh, and, and you hit upon it right now, um, diversity and inclusion um it's an unresolved problem in 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 the developer community the black developer the woman developer um you know the the idea of i mean we have two girls you know they're twins i'd love for them to embrace computer science and you know even probably do a phd i mean i was a dropout i'd love for them to do better than i did you know get embrace uh, you know things that are adjacent to biology and computer science uh, go solve really hard problems. And we've not done those things. I mean, we've not looked at the community of developers and said, you know, they are the maker and they work with managers and the maker manager world is two different worlds. How do you make this less friction, you know, and how do you make this more delightful? And how do you think of developers as business as if they are the folks who run the business? I think there's a lot that's missing there. And, and again, we throw a lot of uh, jargons at them and they, you know, we talk a lot about automation and tools and such, but those are just things. I think, you know, the last 10, 11 years of me uh, really just thinking about product and product portfolio and design and, uh, and the fact that we have uh, so many developers at Nutanix, I think it's been a mind boggling experience thinking about the why and the how and the what of uh, the day in the life of, the month in the life of. Even thinking about simple things like OKRs. I mean, we are throwing these jargons of OKRs at them, productivity, offshoring, remote work, over the Zoom design sessions. It's just full of conflict and friction. So I think there is an amazing opportunity for Nutanix. There's an amazing opportunity for the industry to elevate this where the the woman developer can speak up uh you know in this uh world that's full of so many men uh the black developer can speak up uh and all of us can really think of this as something that's more structured more productive more revenue driven more customer in rather than developer out that's really been some of the things that i've been in my head, things that are still unresolved at Nutanix that I'm pretty sure at many other places out there that's worth thinking and reading and writing about. Well, well Dirich, uh, first of all, thank you so much again for participating here. Uh, it, it's, it's been great having you in the CUBE community uh, pr almost since the inception of us doing it uh, back in 2010. Uh, wish you the best of luck in the current transition and absolutely look forward to talking more in the future. Thank you. And again, uh, big fan of the, the triumvirate of uh, uh, John, Dave, and you. Always learned so much from you folks. Uh, looking forward to be a constant student. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at the, the Cube on Cloud. Lots more coverage here. Be sure to look throughout the site, engage in the chats, and give us your feedback. We're here to help you with the virtual events. I'm Stu Miniman, as always. Thanks for watching.